Sabbath once again. Amen. I just want to thank God for uh, giving all of us the opportunity to be here, to worship, to congregate, and also myself for the opportunity to, uh, to share, with something, uh, share with you something from the Word of God that I trust will be a source of encouragement. Uh, let us bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we pray that may your Holy Spirit be here with us. We pray, Father, that may your Holy Spirit continuously draw each one of us here closer to Jesus Christ every single day. This is our humble request. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now, if you look at your bulletin, the title of our sermon is Go Away From Now for now. And this sermon is meant to be a sort of um, an appeal and also an encouragement. It's an interesting phase, go away for now, that caught my attention and I trust that it will make sense for you before the end of the sermon. Now, are you familiar with this year's conference's uh, theme, camp meeting theme? the Alberta Conference Camp Meeting theme. Do you know what the theme is? Are you familiar with it? Can you raise your hand if you're familiar with the theme for 2017 Alberta Conference Camp Meeting? Raise your hand. The theme for this year's camp meeting is we believe the time is near. Amen? We believe the time is near. And I would like to encourage you, if you have time, go online and take a look at some of the materials that are being shared at the conference at this very moment and also during this past week and how different speakers and different presentations are tied to this theme. Now, we're going to use this theme as a backdrop for today's sermon. We believe the time is near. And what time are we talking about? The second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, let's take a look at John the Baptist. Let's turn to John chapter 1. The book of John chapter 1. Now, we're going to take a look at John chapter 1, verses 19 to 24. I'm going to highlight a few verses, and most of these verses that I will highlight are basically verses where John the Baptist himself is making some very key statements. John chapter 1, verse 19 we're being given an introduction to John and how the priests and the Levites were sent to ask him to interview him as to why he's conducting baptism. And so John has a dialogue with them back and forth. And John gives the following responses. Chapter 1, verse 19. Now we shall read verse 20. Verse 20 says, And he confessed, now this is John the Baptist, And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And verse 21, they ask him again, Who are you? In verse 23, he responds and he says, It says over here, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Again, the dialogue continues. Take a look at verse 26, John's response. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. Now this happened after Jesus Christ was baptized. 
Now, something interesting happens in verse 29. Verse 29, we shall read 29 to 34. 29 says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing in water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Upon whom? Upon Jesus Christ. It abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized it with the Holy Ghost. Verse 34, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So what exactly is happening in these verses here? John chapter 1, verses 19 to 24. Well, John is being questioned, who are you? Are you the Christ? But I want us to take specific note of how John responds to these questions. John clearly separates himself. And he clearly clarifies, I am not the Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. John clearly tells them, not me, but the Lamb of God. Put your focus on him. Now, the interesting thing about this phase, behold the Lamb of God, John had not fully explained the meaning. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John uttered the words, behold the Lamb of God. But he had not provided his audience with the full meaning of this expression. But I want to give you an illustration. Now, let's think back in the Old Testament. Let's pick a lot of the people that are mentioned in the Old Testament. For example, Abraham or Isaac. Now, Abraham was a wealthy man. Abraham understood the sacrificial system. Now, you will notice that being a wealthy man, he had a lot of flock. Thousands. And so here's my question. If Abraham has, let's say, 10,000 sheep, and he knows that he needs to give a sacrifice to God, does Abraham go out and goes through all his flock, his entire flock, 10,000 maybe? Does he spend that much time going to his flock and looking for the exact sheep that he should give a sacrifice for? Because remember, when you have 10,000 sheep, most likely you have sheep that are giving birth every single day. So now just think about this. How does Abraham know that, okay, I need to go grab this sheep or that sheep in order to give a sacrifice out of the 10,000 or the thousands that he has? And not just him, but many people in the Old Testament. How did they know? And even if they didn't have 10,000, even if someone had like five sheep, how did she or he know which one to pick. I hope this illustration will make sense. I remember growing up, we kept chicken. And it was a tendency back then that when you have chicken, you always save the chicken for a special occasion. And One thing that you'd most likely do, you'd most likely keep an eye on your chicken every single day and know specifically which one's healthy, 
and which one will sort of be due for whatever occasion that you're saving it for. And we see this also being practiced even today. Whenever we have county fairs, what do ranchers do? They usually take some of their prized animals for display. And how do they know which animals to present? Well, they keep an eye on the animals every single day from birth. And so with this illustration, what I'm trying to get at is Abraham and many others, whether you're going to present a lamb for a sacrifice or whether you're going to present a turtle dove for a sacrifice, from the moment that animal is born, you are going to keep an eye on it. Now, if that animal develops a defect or shows any defect during birth or during its life before it's sacrificed, then that will disqualify that animal. So the point that I'm driving, trying to drive home here is that you want to keep an eye on the animal every single day so that when the moment comes, you don't have to go through your entire flock but you will know specifically this animal is ready for the sacrifice. So the point is keeping an eye. And so when John says, behold, the Lamb of God, is John implying that, oh, take a look just once and that's it. As I read these verses, it seems very clear that John is saying, keep an eye on him. He is the Lamb of God, even though John himself had not fully explained what this expression meant. Now let's take a look at verse 35. What happens in verse 35? 35 to 37. The next day, what happens the next day? And again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and who are those two disciples? Andrew and John. John, the son of Zebedee. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. The second time. Now take note of verse 37. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. For these two disciples, they were thrilled. Even though they didn't fully understand the expression, Behold the Lamb of God. But they were thrilled and they realized that what John is telling them is not just take a quick glance at the Lamb of God. But John through the Holy Spirit is impressing on their hearts that keep an eye on Him. And what do they do? They followed Jesus. Now, even to make it a little bit more clear, let's move over to chapter 3, verse 27. John chapter 3, verse 27. John the Baptist makes it even more clearer to his remaining disciples. Chapter 3, verses 37 to John chapter 3, not 37, but 27. It says over here, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John makes it even more clear this time. He says, you know, behold the Lamb of God. He is the bridegroom. Keep your eyes constantly on him. And if you were to read a little bit further what was happening here, 
there was tension and conflict developing between the disciples of Jesus Christ and those of John. And Satan was trying to take advantage of that. So when John was baptizing, baptizing, he had a message for his audience. And his audience included two groups. Remember John rebuked some of the leaders and some of the priests? And remember John received some of the Jews that were considered sinners. So John's message targeted two groups, those that were converted and those that were unconverted, encouraging them to behold the Lamb of God. Keep your eyes on him constantly. And so John, by preparing the way for Jesus Christ, he was presenting Jesus Christ to his audience. Although even John the Baptist himself did not fully understand how the mission of Jesus Christ was going to unfold. So John the Baptist, in his preaching, he was basically presenting Jesus Christ to his audience. Behold the Lamb of God. Keep an eye on him. Not once, but constantly. So what does it mean to present Jesus Christ? Let's take a look at John chapter 16. Jesus Christ himself speaking. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, and we shall read from verse 7. Now, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking to his disciples. John chapter 16, verse 7 says, all the way to 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away... The Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, verse 8. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So the Holy Spirit will reprove humanity of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for sin. Of righteousness, because Jesus Christ is righteous, his oneness with God in righteousness of judgment because Jesus Christ eventually will destroy sin and he is not in harmony with sin so the Holy Spirit reproves the world of sin righteousness and judgment and so how does he do this how will the Holy Spirit reprove the world from the above verses that we just read what the Holy Spirit basically does, he basically presents Jesus Christ to humanity. And as humanity beholds Jesus Christ, we better understand what sin is, righteousness is, and what judgment is. And so the Holy Spirit presents and glorifies Jesus Christ, therefore helping humanity to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, helping humanity to clearly see their condition and recognize the need for help, to help humanity to see the direction where they can get help, and also to help humanity receive that help. And lastly, the Holy Spirit helps humanity to remain in Jesus Christ. And you will notice that this is exactly what the Holy Spirit was accomplishing through John the Baptist. As John the Baptist was preaching, 
He was reproving them of sin, righteousness, and judgment to whatever capacity that his audience needed at that given time. In essence, by preparing the way, John the Baptist was presenting Jesus Christ to his audience. And through that, encouraging them not to take just one glance, but instead to fix their eyes on him. Now let's move over to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. Now Acts chapter 24 is a very interesting chapter. When you get a chance, read the whole chapter. Here we can learn a few things from Paul, Felix, and Drusilla. In Acts chapter 24, verses 1 to 21, Paul is being tried. Charges have been brought against him, and Felix is the presiding, presiding judge. In verses 22 to 23 of that chapter, Felix dismisses the hearing and provides instruction regarding Paul. Now I want you to pay attention because this is where we get the title for our sermon. And this is where the main point for the sermon lies. Now let's take a look at two verses. Chapter 24, verse 24, and then later 25. Now remember, Felix has already dismissed the trial, and he has already given instructions regarding Paul, how Paul should be taken care of and allowed certain freedoms while still being under arrest. Now let's read verse 24. Let's pay close attention. Verse 24. And he, that is Felix, sorry, that's verse 23. Verse 24. And after certain days, okay, now, again, the trial has already been dismissed and a few days have gone by. Verse 24 here says, And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Amen? Now, when you have the opportunity, try and do some research on Felix's background. He has a very interesting background. And also try and do some research on his wife, Drusilla. She was a Jew. Also a very interesting background and how they ended up being married. But after Paul went through trial, Felix had an interest in learning a little bit more about Jesus Christ. And we say amen for that. Even Paul glorified God when Paul got this calling. So here we have husband and wife wanting to hear more about the faith in Jesus. So what exactly do they want to hear more about? They want to know more about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And so what happens in verse 25? Through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Paul takes the opportunity. It says over here in verse 25, And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, meaning Paul, Paul was now in the audience of Felix and Drusilla, and he spoke to them about what? He spoke to them about righteousness, 
about temperance, about judgment. In some translations, temperance is replaced here with self-control. He presented to them righteousness. This is the same righteousness that we read in John chapter 16 that Jesus Christ was speaking about. He presented to, the, to them temperance. This is the same as sin that Jesus Christ was talking about in John chapter 16 because a lack of temperance is shown through lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Paul also spoke to them about judgment. And this is the same judgment that Jesus Christ mentioned in John chapter 16. In all these three items, what exactly was Paul doing for Felix and Drusilla? Well, he was basically presenting to them Jesus Christ and giving them the opportunity to know him better. Amen? Now let's take a look at verse 25 again because there was a fateful response. And this is where we get the title for our sermon. Verse 25 says, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, meaning as Paul presented to them who Jesus Christ is, Felix trembled. And what was his answer? It says over here, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Jesus Christ was presented to Felix and Drusilla. But Felix gave a fateful response. Felix said, Go your way. Go away. Go away. It is no longer convenient to have you around. When it is convenient for me, I will call you again. So who exactly was Felix addressing? Was he addressing Paul? Of course, Paul was there. But Felix was actually addressing Jesus Christ and telling Jesus Christ to go away. Because Jesus Christ was presented to Felix and Drusilla and the Holy Spirit impressing on their hearts the words of Paul, which related to Jesus Christ, speaking of righteousness, temperance, and judgment. But Felix decides to tell Jesus Christ to go away. So why is this important? We're going to tie it all together. Why is this important? At the beginning of today's sermon, we mentioned that we believe the time is near. Amen? We believe the time is near. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is presenting to Jesus, is presenting Jesus Christ to everyone, both those that are converted and unconverted. And so today's focus, we're not necessarily wanting to focus on the unconverted, such as Felix and Drusilla, but in today's sermon we want to notice and focus on those that profess Jesus Christ. Because the response is the same. When the Holy Spirit presents Jesus Christ to those that are converted and those that are unconverted, we have one of two responses. Either it will be, come into my life, Lord, or it will be, go away for now. It is not convenient for me to have you around. 
And so our focus today is on those that profess Jesus Christ, not on the unconverted as Felix and Drusilla. I would like to highlight that those that profess Jesus Christ are in danger of giving the same response as Felix and Drusilla. And this includes myself. In the great controversy, the book, page 43, it says, there have been, there have ever been two classes among those who profess to be followers of Christ. While one class study the Savior's life and earnestly seek to correct their defects and conform to the pattern, the other class shun the plain practical truths which expose their errors. As you read the sermon title, we're being reminded that we're in danger of being in a condition where we're telling Jesus Christ to go away. As you go through our opening hymn, we're being reminded that we need to take time to be acquainted with Jesus Christ. And even as we shall sing our closing hymn, we're being reminded that we need to behold Jesus Christ and may he be all the world to us. And so I have two appeals today. My first appeal is that as Christians, every single day, when the Holy Spirit presents Jesus Christ to us and reveals his character to us, let us not respond like Felix and Drusilla by telling Jesus Christ to go away because his presence is no longer convenient for us. And my second appeal, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Keep your eyes on the, bri on the bridegroom. Let us take heed to the words of John the Baptist. Let us not take just a single glance at Jesus Christ. But just like Andrew and John, let us continuously behold Christ. Let us behold him. Let us study his life and his character, and earnestly seek to correct our defects through his help. And especially now, as we believe that the time is near. Now, you'll also notice that it's not just beholding and keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ that makes a difference. Because remember, the disciples beheld Jesus Christ and constantly focused on him. They experienced change. But also, we have one disciple like Judas. And also, we had the many spies from the, from the uh, leaders who were sent to spy on Jesus Christ. They also beheld Jesus Christ constantly. And even some of the rulers, the priests, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they beheld him constantly. But what was the difference between their type of beholding and that of the disciples? So when John says, behold the Lamb of God, keep your eyes on him, stay focused on him, it goes beyond that. there is a resulting change that the Holy Spirit brings as we behold Jesus Christ, and that's the difference. And so, is it true? Is it true that Jesus Christ wants us to behold him and be changed? So let's go back where we started, and we shall read our final three verses. John chapter 1. Is it true that Jesus Christ wants us to take more than just a single glance at him, but instead to focus continuously on him? What happens here in John chapter 1, verses 37? Let's read 37 to 39. It says over here, And the two disciples heard him speak, right? So John and Andrew heard John the Baptist speak, 
and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Verse 39, And he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And so, yes, it is true. Jesus Christ wants us to behold him continuously. Jesus Christ is telling all of us, come and see. Let us abide together always at all times. So we're being reminded, let us behold the Lamb of God let us receive Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit presents him to us every single day. Let us study Jesus Christ and get to know him better. We believe the time is near. And we also believe that we need to have a continuous clear appreciation of who Jesus Christ is as time goes on and be drawn closer and closer to him. Amen.